You are listening to Gay Essay Radio, where you are family. This is Soul Searching, your weekly radio program where you and I delve into all the important spiritual matters that matter. I am Tom Budge, your host for the next hour. It's an exciting privilege for me to bring you this very special program each and every week here on this radio station. This is the first of many. During the show, I'll tell you a little bit about my background and why this is such an amazing privilege for me to be able to speak to you about something that is very close to my heart. Professionally, I'm often referred to as Budge. That's my real surname, but my friends and family usually just refer to me as Thomas or Tom. It's a strange thing because Budge is defined in the dictionary as a word meaning to persuade, induce, move, sway, or convince. Budge is frequently used as a verb when causing someone to reconsider or change an opinion, a decision, or a stated position, like they couldn't budge the lawyer. So it's rather strangely coincidental, yet quite apt, that my name is Budge, because it nicely describes what I do for a living. You see, I'm a spiritual teacher, a life coach, an NLP practitioner, and also a hypnotherapist. So you can see the coincidence. I persuade and convince people to make changes in life, and I often help them to change their opinions, decisions, and purpose. So it's, a, it's crazy, kind of, that my surname is Budge. But there's a humorous quirk to this, though, too. Thomas was one of Jesus' disciples. Remember, he was the guy that needed to stick his fingers into Jesus' wounds because he wasn't quite sure that this was the Christ risen from the dead. So while my surname is all about movement and conviction, my first name is all about doubt. This, in a nutshell, is the story of my life. I'm 63 years old. I was born in South Africa. I landed myself in jail under the old apartheid regime because I stuck to my beliefs and my principles as a kid. I'm a gay man who is currently in a straight relationship. Like so many other gay adolescents, my teenage years were seriously conflicted. You see, I grew up in a Jehovah's Witness household that was governed by what was considered proper sexual conduct, sets of strict moral rules and laws. Homosexuality in this context is a sin of serious proportions. It was only in my mid-forties that I came to truly celebrate my sexuality. Until then, sexual expression always seemed out of balance. I denied it as a youth, kind of overexpressed it as an adult, and only settled comfortably with it in my mid-forties. There were decades of suffering before it culminated in my sexual liberation. I was one of those likable and obedient children, and uh, I was loved by all. But even at an early age of around eight or nine, I knew that somehow there was something about me that was different. I didn't have the words to contextualize what was happening to me back then. It was only later that I started to realize that I was not only attracted to, but maybe even somewhat obsessed with masculine sexuality. As I acquired the language to describe my feelings, my sexuality, like so many other gay boys, manifest at first as confusion. Then as I mapped it to others' beliefs about what they considered to be proper sexual behavior, especially as laid down in Jehovah's Witnesses' doctrine, confusion turned to guilt, which then morphed into shame and culminated in self-loathing. I knew I couldn't speak about it to anyone, especially not to the church elders, as that would have led me down only one of two pathways, either sexual denial or expulsion from the church. I chose silence because I thought it was the only real way out. Finally, at the age of 27, uh, I parted ways with the Jehovah's Witnesses and was excommunicated out of the church. According to Jehovah's Witness doctrine, that meant that I had to be completely shunned by by my family, and I've had no real association with them ever since. I've had three serious long-term relationships, all with amazing men, all of whom are still dear friends of mine today. And it was only in the last decade that Yvonne and I began a relationship in a brand new context, one that I had never explored before, and in the beginning, I must tell you, one that nearly frightened me to death. There are a a lot of words out there to describe sexual proclivity, like straight. That's a word that describes someone who likes the opposite sex. Or there's the word gay, which describes someone who is attracted to the same sex. Of course, we have the word bisexual. It's a term that labels someone who likes both genders. And metro, which uh, designates a straight man who is comfortable to display a more effeminate attitude. 
and I suppose also by curious that describes a straight or gay person curious about the opposite sex. There are many terms out there that uh, describe various sexual interests and leanings, but none of them really seem to fit me properly, and I couldn't wear any of them. None described how I feel, how I act as a person, and who I am. So today, I choose not to label myself at all. Isn't it strange how things work out in life? I sat down the other day when I saw that my dear friend Hendrik Baird was the station manager for Gay SA Radio, and uh, I wrote him an email. I said to him, uh, listen, Hendrik, if you're looking for uh, the occasional interview about some spiritual stuff, uh, then give me a shout. I'll glad, uh, gladly do an interview or two for you. And uh, I dispatched the email, and a couple of days later, Hendrik said to me, OK, why don't you pop by and come and see me on Saturday afternoon? So that's precisely what I did. I got in the car and trotted from where I live across to the, the studio. And uh, when I got to the, uh, the studio, I saw that there, was a, there were a whole lot of other people around. And I sort of said hello to, to Hendrik and uh, to Ethan. And uh, before I knew it, I sort of ushered ahead of the queue and Ethan said, stand in front of the microphone. We need to take a sample of your voice, which is exactly what I did. And I had to read out an ad and I didn't quite get it right the first time around, but I tried it the second time. And then uh, Hendrik gave me a contract and said, he has a contract. Uh, we want you to sign this. I said, contract for what? He says, uh, we'd love you to produce and present the show. Uh, Soul Searching goes out every uh, Sunday afternoon between five and six, and uh, you're the ideal person to do it. I thought, oh, my goodness, that's, uh, that's now something that I wasn't prepared for. It's now taken quite a few weeks of preparation to come to terms with the show's content knowing that everyone comes from different religious backgrounds, has different spiritual beliefs, and uh, expresses one's spirituality in different ways. This proves to be quite an interesting challenge for the show. And I hope to do interviews with various people uh, from each of the mainstream religions. Uh, some of it may be quite provocative. At other times, it may be really quite conciliatory. But I hope to bring diverse opinion to the show, a little bit of my own wisdom. And then we'll dip into interesting alternative ways of perhaps expressing one's spirituality and trying to find out what spirituality itself really is. I suppose part of one's spirituality is a connection with a higher self, a higher presence, but it's also perhaps got to do with purpose and, and presence and trying to answer some of those fundamental questions like, why am I here? What am I doing? How can I live life more meaningfully? And so on. I must tell you a little story that seems to have bothered me just of late. I'm an avid journaler, and some two months ago, I was writing in my journals, and I started to write about feelings of personal despair. And I came to realize that I was no longer living life authentically. This is not a new theme. This is quite an old theme that pops up periodically in my journals. And I know that it has some very deep roots in my past. Learning to live authentically was one of the primary motivators that led me to make spiritual pilgrimages to go and visit my spiritual teacher, Ram Das. He is an amazing being who lives in Hawaii. I now have the spiritual legs that I lacked when I was younger, and I'm rather ready to embrace who I am more than I ever did before. Self-acceptance led to better opportunities in life and in a richness in the way I work. So I wondered why I was writing about feelings of despair and what it was that held them in place. Mind mapping is one of my very most useful tools for self-introspection. And so I grabbed a handful of colored gel pens and the other day I began to draw. And it soon emerged that my feelings of despair were revolving around sexual identity. Now this totally surprised me because I had thought I'd dealt with this a very, very long time ago. What came out of my writing and my introspection was something to do with uh, Pilates classes that Yvonne and I attend once a week. Our instructor is a young man by the name of Paul. I, From the very first time that I met him, I kind of understood that he was gay. But he, what he did is he kept referring to Yvonne as my wife. And that just seemed so wrong. 
Even though part of me desperately wanted him to, him to know all about me, I never corrected him, but it bothered me more and more. And those two little words, your wife, stung really hard and sore. Ramdas taught me that one needed to drop all labels if we were to reclaim our spirituality in its fullest extent. I'm of the belief that you and I are magnificent beings of infinite possibility. After all, it is said that we were made in the likeness and image of God. And you cannot, you cannot get more magnificent than that, can you? By describing yourself as anything less is surely only going to detract from your splendor as a magnificent being of infinite possibility. If I labeled myself as a therapist, then I limit myself to what therapists do. If I call myself a teacher, then I'm confined by that. While these are real experiences and skills that I have, you and I are much, much more than any one of those things put together. So to allow your magnificence to truly shine through in all the limitless ways it can, you will eventually have to do as I did. Drop all of your labels and see yourself in all your magnificence as a facet of the divine, an inner Godhead, a truly beautiful being of amazing spiritual radiance, ready to take its rightful place in this universe. Once that happens, no labels seem to quite fit properly anymore. Sure, I understand that there's safety in our collective identity, but in order to snugly embrace the fullest extent of who you are, you will have to rise above these labels and uncouple yourself from what they imply. This is not a denial of who you are, but it is instead the ultimate acceptance of who you can be. So you can see why I was a little surprised to find myself writing about an existential crisis because Paul had referred to Yvonne as your wife. I knew that I needed to celebrate all of who I am, including my gayness. So I chose to give Paul a copy of my autobiography, and I made a promise to fully celebrate every facet of who I am. So I still don't know how to label myself, and I'm reluctant to, to even do that. But it seems rather irrelevant now. By fully embracing all of who I am, I am ready to accept a challenge to become everything that I can be. Thank you for staying with me. We're busy chatting about uh, this program as it is the first of a sequence of programs uh, in which we hope to speak about all the spiritual things that are important to us, especially here in the LGBTI community. In my late 20s, I was outed by a family member who sort of hunted me down and exposed the fact that I was gay. That, as I said before, created quite a lot of havoc in my family and um, for most part, I haven't seen any of my family and had anything to do with them for the last 30 odd years. I felt rather abandoned by my family and also I felt abandoned by God. How could this divine being of amazing love, unconditional love, put conditions on how I uh, should behave when this was not something that I really had much control over. Uh, I kind of felt right from the very beginning that this was the way I was born and this was my fate in life. And I was rather sad that God seemed to have abandoned me and overlooked me. So there was a period in my life where spiritual things didn't seem to have any importance at all. Uh, what was important were material things. I tried to look good. I was out socializing and clubbing and doing all the things uh, that seemed to add meaning to life at that particular time. Spirituality completely went onto the back burner. And in fact, I must confess that perhaps I even abandoned God. It wasn't until much later in life that a couple of things started to happen to me that brought about a a new sense of neediness, that there was a, a shallowness, a hollowness about me, uh, no matter how much material possessions I had, no matter how well we were traveled, no matter how nice my friends were, there was still something that was missing at the very core of who I am as a being. I didn't realize it then, but uh, I, I now call it my spirituality. I, I'm happy to identify it as such. In the beginning, and trying to grapple with my spirituality, 
I started to read publications and books that I would never would have read before because I thought that these were probably uh, books that were inappropriate for any Christian to read. One of those books was Neil Donald Walsh's Conversations with God. And I remember in the beginning thinking, how can he even be so blasphemous to call his books A Conversation with God? Of course, I now understand how profound the title really is, and we'll maybe talk about that in a, in a future show. But this started a, a new kind of relationship with a divine being that wasn't nearly as judgmental as uh, the Jehovah that the Jehovah's Witnesses believed in. Here was a being that was humorous, tolerant. This was a God that was accommodating and accepting and suddenly I feel, felt as though I was back where I belonged. I felt safe enough to explore Eastern religions and other philosophies. And slowly I created a spirituality that is particularly my own. It's a kind of copy-paste of many other ideas from other places that I assemble into one space, a space that works for me, that brings me to the highest pin pinnacle of who I can be as a person. So somewhere in this quest of mine, I came to see that I had unlimited potential. It was a very bold statement to make, but it was one that is absolutely true. Why is it so impossible for me to make that statement, to unleash my inner strength in order to find new strivings in life? There's an amazingly profound postulation in psychology. Your beliefs are your home. The world only exists in your head. Everything you know has reached your awareness through your five senses. Since tiny, you began creating a complex database about everything. You labeled every object and every concept. You judged them to determine whether they were friend or foe. You documented their attributes and their interrelationships with other things. So where do you find your database? It's in your head. How you live life is determined by what you believe. Your interaction with your world is governed by the contents of your database. If you had traumatic experiences as a child, they will have inescapably influenced the way you behave as an adult. These experiences may have turned you into a victim, but they could also have made you victorious. Either way, you are a different person today compared to who you might have been had you not had those experiences as a child. Everything in your past contributes to who you are today. But how you choose to think differently today will determine who you shall become tomorrow. Your inability to realize your full potential is commonly blocked by inhibiting thoughts, old erroneous beliefs, and perhaps even physical limitations. However, recognizing, understanding, and overcoming your spiritual, mental, and physical inhibitors helps you to achieve much, much more in life. It positively enhances everything you know about yourself. Perhaps one of the most profound relationships that you could ever enter into is to start a relationship with yourself. How many of us truly love who we are? Not in a narcissistic way, of course, but in a gentle, spiritual, easy way. How many of us are proud to be who we are? How many of us in that relationship with self strive to be the best that we can? Imagine if you walked into a room and you saw yourself on the other side of the room. Would you be inclined to walk up and say hello to that other person? Would you think that person is worth getting to know as a friend or even as a lover? That's the kind of relationship that we're looking for in creating this relationship with self. And perhaps there's only one thing that we ever need to ask ourselves is, this that I'm about to do, this that I'm about to say, these thoughts that I'm about to think, these actions that I'm about to perform, are they going to bring me into a better relationship with me? You see, you can let go, lovers. Relationships can change. People may die. Friends may move away. But one thing's for sure. You will always, always be in your own company. And that's a relationship that ought to be a healthy one. In his book, How to Know God, Deepak Chopra writes about the seven stages of God. 
He said that our perception of God changes depending on where we stand spiritually in life. The psychologist Abraham Maslow proposed a hierarchy of needs predicated on fulfilling innate human needs in priority. There are interesting parallels between Chopra's stages of God and Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Simply put, Maslow describes our most primitive needs as that of survival. Above it, our need for safety, followed by a need for social belonging, then a need for esteem, and it culminates in a need for a sense of self. We cannot possibly attain self-realization while struggling to meet all our underlying needs. As we transform and satisfy each of our new needs, new possibilities arise for us to redefine what God means to us. When fighting for survival, God is our provider. When we seek safety, He is our savior and protector. When we yearn for love and social acceptance, He becomes our Father. As we build esteem, our need to respect self and earn the respect of others, He becomes our friend. Once we reach full realization, however, God the Father and God the Son merge and become one. So if God isn't literally an old man supporting a long white beard somewhere out there, then who or what is he? I'm somewhat torn between the mere symbolism of God and the possibility of an actual presence of some sorts, a yet undiscovered intelligence which is the designer and creator of our universe. If this intelligent presence actually exists, I would then agree that it is accurate to say that God is nowhere, not in any specific place, yet found everywhere in everything throughout the universe. It would be equally true to say that he is nothing, neither this nor that, yet found in everything. That would make him omnipotent, omnipresent, and almighty. The closest plausible scientific theory that supports all of these attributes of God is perhaps the zero-point field of quantum physics. This field is supposedly the coordinating intelligence of the vacuum of space, which in quantum field theory is defined not as empty space itself, but as the ground state of all other fields. It is theorized that this field carries all the information necessary to maintain consistency across the universe. Yet every holy text I have ever read speaks of God far more personally than a mere compassionless backdrop to space. Besides the Old Testament's notion of a jealous, tyrannical, and dictatorial God, we also think of him as kind, caring, and loving, a being with whom we could forge a relationship. Unless I am now being trapped in my own anthropomorphic snare, the aforementioned don't seem to be attributes that I would readily ascribe to the field. If God is plausibly neither an old man in space nor some theorized ground state of all universal fields, then who is he, she, or it? Perhaps we must look outwards in our quest to find God when we stand fighting for survival. But at an elevated position of self-realization, at the apex of Maslow's pyramid, we have a panoramic understanding and can find God elsewhere. I find it uncanny that the chakras loosely map to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which in turn loosely maps, as we've seen, to our understanding of God. Starting at the heart, the seat of human emotions, all lower chakras symbolize our physical struggles as humans, our psychological need for air, food and water, our need to reproduce and our need for safety. The heart chakra neatly matches to our need for love and belonging. All the upper chakras tie nicely in with Maslow's classifications of esteem and self-realization. It seems that during our primitive states of neediness, we seem to go downwards and outwards from the heart chakra into the material world in order to find spiritual meaning. Otherwise, to satisfy our sophisticated psychological and spiritual needs, we go inwards and upwards from the heart chakra to discover a more abstracted form of God within. Can we achieve reconciliation of the primitive conceptualizations of God with the more enlightened views of oneness without changing God? Can the wise old man in heaven be the same God in the mindful experience of the enlightened being? I read a beautiful analogy in Yehuda Berg's book, The Power of the Kabbalah. He draws a symbolic parallel between the mechanisms of the solar system and our relationship with God. 
The sun knows only how to give, and all of Mother Nature knows only how to receive that gift. This establishes a harmonious balance. Nature takes without conscience. It also never takes without any form of greediness. We were, in our early evolution, reactive beings that belonged to nature. The Garden of Eden is symbolic of an uncomplicated, harmonious coexistence with all else. However, it came with a warning, a kind of sinister prophecy waiting to happen. Do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I can't imagine this as anything other than being akin to our ability to think rationally and to judge. The moment we developed a frontal cortex with a capacity to judge good from evil, we started to separate ourselves from the rest of nature. We were no longer content, reactive beings living in total harmony with our environment. Instead, we became restless in our quest to be much, much more as we strove to be godlike, co-creators of our universe. We sacrificed our reactionary place in nature to become proactive and God thus symbolically barred us from his paradise garden of natural balance. Slowly at first, but with increasing rapidity, we learned to have dominion over all of nature. We began to control it, to exploit it to re-engineer it, and perhaps soon to even create it. Since our eviction from Eden, we have remained trapped in dissatisfaction and discontent. Egoism stands in opposition to godliness. Earth, as symbolized by the lower chakras and Maslow's primitive needs, rebukes heaven, our enlightened state of self-realization, and our unification with God. Egoism is the idolatry, the false god, to whom so many devote themselves so fervently. To go down and out in the material world is hell. It separates us from God and necessitates an external search for him somewhere above in the clouds. To go inwards and upwards, aligning ourselves with our higher self, is heaven. I'm really excited about presenting these shows every week. We'll take a look at different religions. We'll take a look at different belief systems. We'll spend time searching deep into the soul because that's the only place where I think we will ever find meaning in a rather chaotic and mixed up world. If you have any suggestions for this program or wish to contact me to make some comments, then please feel free to do so via the station's uh, email address. That is studio at gaysaradio.co.za. Of course, you can also use the radio station's uh, social media networks, those you will find on the website, www.gaysaradio.co.za. Let me leave you with this thought for the week. It comes from a British psychiatrist, philosopher, and teacher by the name of Maurice Nicholl, a man must get to know himself before he can change. Our mental habits are to us not habits, but truth. They seem quite right to us. We cannot see them as habits, and this is the tragedy. My name is Tom Budge. This is Soul Searching here on Gay SA Radio, where you are family. I look forward to being with you every Sunday between 5 and 6 in the afternoon. Until next time, goodbye.